Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. And my name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, mm-hmm. for the questions, yeah, I have a question for you, Jeff. <gasps> What's that? What time is it? Uh, sure. Oh, no, sorry. The clock's right there. Oh. Uh, my question is, how are you doing today? I'm doing uh, pretty well. Cool. Um, kind of excited for uh, Thanksgiving coming yeah. up. Yeah, same here. I know I, I talked uh, uh, last time about, or t- t- a couple times ago, about I was gonna um, I was gonna smoke a turkey and mm-hmm. then I was, um, and I was gonna like roast one too. So I I tested out my smoker the other day to not so great results. Oh, uh, I posted about it on Facebook. I don't, I don't know if you saw, it, but so I I, I never used a smoker before. I decided to try it out, you know, with the test turkey and everything. So I brined the test turkey like I do because brining is is amazing. <laughs> Sorry. And then, yeah, you have a test turkey. Go ahead. Yes. And so, yeah, I had a test turkey and two act, two actual turkeys. Right. Um, so I went and, you know, I got I got charcoal. I got wood chips. I put them out in the I, I got everything going, but the smoker just would not get up to the right temperature, mm. which was really frustrating. I mean, you know, we're in Michigan. It was it's kind of cold this time of year. It was, right, it was yeah. in the high 30s that day. And, you know, I I was a little bit concerned about the outside temperature, but I had been assured that as long as you just, you know, make sure to fill it up with charcoal and everything, like, it's more about, it's more a matter of you'll just have to use more fuel to maintain the temperature than it is to actually get it up to the temperature. But no matter what, I just could not get it hot enough. And I mean, the turkey, it doesn't have to be a high temperature. When you're smoking things, it's, you know, it, it tends to be a lower temperature for a longer period of time. Yeah. And so... The thermometer, you know, goes up to like 500 degrees or something, and I only needed it to be 240. But the highest I was able to get it is like 175. Oh. Like I, I got it up to, you know, I would I would put a bunch of charcoal in there that was already already you know pre started and it was like the perfect amount of ash and whatever, and then it would it would like go up to like 200 degrees for about five minutes and then go down to 175. Huh. And it was really frustrating because like it's it. It what it doesn't have to be that high, and it was getting nowhere near where it needed to be. Right, and then, you know, it would it would be at a stable one seventy five, which was way lower than I needed. Yeah, and so it was really frustrating. I I did, you know, put the turkey in there, hoping that like I could just add more charcoal and whatnot. Um, after about two or three hours of having it at one seventy five, I, I gave up on it. Yeah, so I just put it in the oven and then cooked it in the oven, but. Those two or three hours that it spent in the smoker still made it taste amazing. Oh, nice. I'm kind of frustrated because it's like, that shouldn't work. I'm all about like, <laughs> you follow the rules and then it works. <laughs> so if you, you, you took a, <laughs> you got a, you took a shortcut and it worked. Exactly. So, so, um, I, and I've even done like a couple, I've, I've gotten some advice from people online. Some people said I need to like drill holes in my charcoal pan because no mm. air could get in from the bottom, which I, you know, makes sense. But then I tried that, and it did, I tried that without anything in the smoker, and that didn't work either. Huh. So, um, so on on Thanksgiving, I'll probably try it. You know, give it a couple hours, and if it doesn't work, I'll just again finish it off in the oven. And, yeah. Uh, hopefully, it'll still taste amazing. Because oh my goodness, this turkey tasted so good. <laughs> like, you know, the Michigan Michigan Renaissance Festival has really good turkey legs. Oh yeah, yeah. It tasted like a Renaissance Festival turkey leg. Nice. It was awesome. No, what kind, what kind of wood, wood chips did you use? Well, so the charcoal was like hickory, I think, you know, hickory charcoal. Oh, sure. But then I also, I had apple wood, uh, yeah. wood chips to yeah. go on top. I think, I think that is what they use. Cause like apple wood is a, is a common one for, for making like hams and stuff. Yeah. And it did, and you know, this kind of turkey does taste like ham at the Renaissance Festival. Right. Yeah. Like yeah, Renaissance, the, the, uh, Michigan Renaissance Festival, their turkey legs are the bomb. Yes. Uh, and, you know, they, they usually like. On a on a busier weekend, they'll they'll they run out of stock by like they run out of them by like the middle of the day. Yeah. Um. But yeah, like they they smoke them they like they super smoke them with the uh, apple wood and it comes out looking and tasting like ham. Yeah, which is a good thing. Don't get me wrong. Right. I mean, of course, I like turkey, but like <laughs> when it tastes like ham, I like it even better. Right. It's just it. They're just really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. So so uh, I'm I'm excited <laughs> about Thanksgiving as well. We have some friends coming in from uh, from out of town. Um, so yeah, Thanksgiving should be, should be a lot of fun. It's like I said before, it's one of my favorite holidays and yeah, yeah it's, it's, I just, I, I love food. <laughs> yeah. Tomorrow I need to get started on those, uh, pumpkin cheesecakes. Oh, tomorrow I need to so start, good. get started on like making room for all the food. <laughs> yes. Like I have to, I have to like not eat anything 
too like greasy or anything like that just so my stomach doesn't doesn't get upset Mm -hmm. but i also need to like eat eat enough to where i'm like my stomach doesn't like shrink exactly yeah yeah that's the that's the problem i've i've seen something where there was like a a, like a a, like a food eating contest like a guy who does that for a living or something like kobayashi or whatever (laughs) <laughs> right. Well, not not like a speed eating one, but more of like the like the quantity. The eat, oh, I like, see. You know, eating the most of something. Um, he'll uh, he'll like basically eat a giant bowl of grapes the night before. Oh, because like the grapes are easy to pass or something like that. But so mm-hmm. he can like expand his stomach by eating all these grapes. But then the grapes are easy to to pass. You know, and like they just go through his system a little faster. And so he's just kind of got a big empty stomach. <laughs> By the next day, so like I was like I was like hmm, maybe I'll just buy a bunch of grapes. <laughs> I mean I like grapes. So. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, so I have I have a a clarification or a correction to make Uh-oh. about a previous episode. Uh oh, I, I don't so, know what this is yet. Gabe told me about it. I, I mentioned that I had one. I didn't tell him what it was. So uh, our uh, a buddy of ours, the um, podcast Adventures in Aurelia, Damien, uh-huh. the DM from that uh, that actual play podcast. I'm I'm friends with him on Twitter. You know we we talk back and forth. And uh, he replied to to our episode two episodes ago. We we talked about critical hits, and then we talked about elves trance. Oh, okay. Apparently, we are incorrect. But what? in in our defense, if we had recorded that episode like a month previous, we would have been correct. Oh, uh, what? So did it, they change the rules or something? Yes, they did. So in that episode, we mentioned that the the trance rules don't let you. Take a long rest in four hours because a long rest and sleep are separate. Sure. Uh, the trance rules are still the same, but apparently within the last couple months, they have issued an errata on the long rest rules, which do tie a long rest to sleep, which I think is kind of stupid. Huh. So I do not agree with this errata. <laughs> However, for everybody out there who may listen to our podcast looking for rules, first off, I don't know why you do. We don't really, a lot of our <laughs> questions are not about the rules. Right, yeah. We're more about, uh, you know, just letting you have a, a smooth gameplay session. Sure. But if you listen to us looking for rules, I apologize. <laughs> I was not up to date on that uh, that rule clarification, and so we were incorrect. Right. Uh, I'll find some sort of sound effect, sound effect to play. Like a, like a <laughs> wah, wah sort of thing. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. Um, <laughs> you should just like record somebody going, just laughing at us or something. I don't know. Yeah. All right, um, Gabe. Uh, you wake up to your alarm going off. Oh, my goodness. Uh, you, you you remember that you set that alarm because, oh, yeah, you, you had to uh, put more charcoal in the smoker. Oh, doing, that's what it was. Yeah. yeah doing it overnight. So I'm going to have to get up really early on Thanksgiving to start because the smoker takes like eight hours. Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. So like you, you set, you set yourself, you're, you're trying to get some sleep. So you set yourself a, like an alarm every few hours to go and check on the smoker. Yeah. And uh, so you go out, uh, you go out to the, the, the Florida room there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, you, you realize that your, your charcoal bag is gone. Oh. Uh, and so, uh, roll, roll a, uh, roll a spot check. Okay. A perception check. That is a big seven. That's a big seven. Well, well, seven is a lucky number. Oh. Uh, but it's a bad perception roll. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, you, you don't, you don't see your charcoal bag anywhere. Man, it seems to be, it seems, where it is. It seems to be missing. So, so you, you, st- you, you step outside and, uh, it's a little cold. Yeah. Well, it's not as cold oh. as it should be, you notice. Oh, interesting. Uh, so, so you, t- you take a look around and you, and you see off in the distance, there's a, there's a, there's a faint glow on the other side. Of the fence. I'm not sure where this is going. I don't. I'm not too sure myself. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, you, you you so you you peer over the fence and you see, uh, you see a dragon. Oh no! Over over uh, cooking cooking uh, <laughs> you see he's cooking on a grill and he's he's stolen your. <laughs> He stole my my charcoal. <laughs> he stole your charcoal, and he's he's like, oh hey neighbor, sorry, uh, we just moved in and uh, we didn't have any charcoal for the for the barbecue that I'm having in November outside at night. <laughs> <laughs> that he somehow 
<laughs> needs charcoal for despite being a dragon. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's hickory charcoal. That's true. And I guess it probably would be hard to use his breath weapon to get that low and slow temperature. Exactly. See? See, Gabe knows how to cook. I do. I do. Uh, and so uh, the dragon apologizes for, for taking, but he, f- he figured you, you probably wouldn't mind. And uh, to, to make up for it, he gives you a piece of the dragon's horde. Awesome. <laughs> now I have to wonder what what effect on the property value of my home having a dragon in the neighborhood would have. <laughs> I imagine it would go up. Well, I mean, yeah, if it's a D&D dragon, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, they, they're magic. They're, they have tons magical. of magical. They've got a bunch of, of, of magic items and treasure, mm-hmm. you know, so... Uh, if it was like a... I'd say if it was like a Game of Thrones dragon, it, 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 that'd be debatable. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, they are valuable in some way, but I imagine more of a... crime would go down, right? <laughs> Maybe. Especially if that dragon was part of the neighborhood watch. Oh. We, oh. we do have a neighborhood watch in our area. It's pretty nice. Every, every now and then you can see someone driving down the road. And then you would you would change the signs instead of the good, like the guy with the the mask. <laughs> it's an adventurer. It'd be like an adventurer, like a yeah. yeah. <laughs> so give him like a little sword and shield or something. Yes. Um, <laughs> All right. So so what well, uh, so what did the dragon give you? Well, uh, so the dragon gave us an item today that was submitted by our friend Nicholas P. Hi, Nick. This was submitted via email. Uh, he submitted an item called the Eye of Balmar. Not Bill Mar, but Balmar. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this is an amulet of the symbol of the ancient deceased demon lord of madness and chaos. Nice. Balmar, which is an eye with a tear of blood surrounded by three triangles, mm. each with a symbol, one of a vertical line, a horizontal line, and an X. This is a cursed item that oh. must be attuned to use. So <laughs> we're we're a, we're a, we're a big fan of cursed items yes. here at Dragon's Word. <laughs> yes, uh, maybe it's that the dragons that we that we associate with are fans of cursed <laughs> items. Oh my goodness, that neighbor is trying to sabotage me. <laughs> He's trying to get me to leave so he can buy up the property and turn it into a shopping mall because shopping malls are all the rage. Right. Yes. <laughs> yes. Back back now in the late 70s, early 80s. The year 2000. <laughs> yes. The distant future. Right. So uh, in order to attune to this item, you must have a you must spend a long rest with the uh, the amulet next to you. Mm. When you wake up, you will have a giant eye attached to the back of your head by a tendril. What? With three triangles floating around it, and you now have Balmar's soul inside you and can <laughs> speak with him in your mind. Oh. So... Some definite visible effects of being attuned to this item. But new best friend. New best friend. Good point. Um, so hopefully you get along, you know. <laughs> best friend of me. You go to like, you you go to put on the newest season of American Horror Story. He's like, ah, I liked the witch season better. And you're like, wait a what? minute. <laughs> no. Anyway. Uh, Balmar is a madman. As I just said, he liked the season of the witch season of American Horror Story the best. What the heck? What's what's the actri- actress's name? Uh, Sarah Paulson. No. Or uh, Jessica Lang. I mean, I guess there's a lot of actresses. I'm just uh, naming off actresses. The, the one, who, the Misery Lady. What's I oh oh um uh, uh oh Kathy Bates. Bates. Kathy Bates. Everybody. Kathy Bates. Since I clearly edited this out, we had a long, long <laughs> debate about what what actress this was. So Kathy <laughs> Kathy Bates. Right. The drag. The are the, the the mad guy just really likes Kathy Bates. I guess. I mean, then he should watch one of the later seasons instead. Anyway, so yes, he is a madman seeing the world as a plaything for him to destroy for fun. Ooh. He respects no life at all and puts himself on a pedestal. He constantly insults others and makes morbid jokes to laugh maniacally. I like this guy. <laughs> I guess. So with the eye attached to you, you can do a few different things. With it, you can summon Balmar's powers for charges. Every day you get seven charges and they are fully replenished every long rest, hmm. which apparently is tied to sleep in some way or another. Anyway, sorry, I'm a little, a little bitter about that. For the first one, you can expend a charge of the eye to fire an eye blast from it. Now, in Nicholas P's, uh, his, his, his notes here, he said, roll a d10 on the eye blast table to see which one it is. <laughs> I have no clue what book has an eye blast table, but I want that book. Right. <laughs> I mean, maybe he's talking about, like, uh, the Beholder eye stalks, sure. possibly, but yeah. like, I want a book that has an eye blast table in it. <laughs> the eye blast table. Right. So, I mean, I, I suppose you could roll just in like, if that is a beholder, mm. Nick, I apologize. I did, I did try to, to send him an email, but uh, 
he hasn't gotten back to me yet. Anyway, um, so you know, you could probably roll on the the beholder chart to see which sure. one. Um, anyway, so yeah, so you can spend a charge to shoot an eye blast. For two charges, you can have flames billow from your mouth. Breathing fire like a young dragon, dealing the same amount of damage. So oh. I'm guessing, you know, open up uh, the monster manual, look at one of the young, dragon. young dragons. Uh, for for two charges, your eye stares into the enemy's souls. Ooh. All monsters and enemies that can see it, so not that it can see, but that can see it, must make a DC 15 wisdom saving throw oh. or roll on the long-term madness, madness. table. Yeesh. Now, that is a table I'm familiar with. Yeah. We talked about it a few episodes ago. And that's no joke. Right? Yeah. <laughs> My goodness. Long term. So you just go mad by looking into the eye. I guess, yeah. And then for three charges, two black feathered wings sprout from your back, giving you flight for one minute. Oh. Now, I, I personally think that's it's a bit less powerful than giving someone a long-term madness. Right. But uh, anyway, yeah, yeah. That definitely has its uses. Sure. But every time you use one of these powers, you must roll a DC 13 wisdom save. On a fail, Balmar gains more control of your body, morphing it into slightly into a slightly more monstrous form. Cool. Slowly trying to change you into a new body for him so that he may live again, bringing destruction to the world. Yay! I so, like that. <laughs> yes. I think that's so, cool. So, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a cool item. It's definitely got, I like items with a bunch of uses. I like items with, uh, you know, a distinct theme. And this one, whew, I don't think I would use it because I don't want uh, Balmar to take over my my body and then destroy the world. Mm-hmm. I mean, but to what, tune yourself with it, you just have to sleep with it in your possession. I mean, yeah, it's, it's pretty much, pretty much. Uh, now, is that... Uh, willingly or is it if you just happen to have it on your person well that's a very good question and then can it can you remove it it's a cursed item probably not that's that's a very good point i didn't even think of that so like Um, you might have this thing and then you use it a couple times and you fail like you fail once and you like you, you know you get like pointy teeth or something i don't know yeah um my goodness. I don't know. I think that's a cool thing. Like you just, your character like has to wear a hat all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Otherwise people go mad around him. Now, see, I, th- I thought you were going to say, put this in someone else's possession. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, but then the yeah. end result is still Balmar takes over the world. Right. Yeah. But, uh, oh, yeah. what? E- even better. Uh, play, uh, uh, give it to a warlock who has like a, um, uh, what what a, what a, a patron? A patron, yeah, yeah. Who has like a patron, uh, like one of like one of the like the dark lords or something like that. Yeah, and then he also has this, and so oh. they're like fighting over. They're fighting over controlling you or something like that. There's, yeah. Like, so like, because one's talking, like they're both talking in your head or something. So like, they're, they're kind of like at war with each other, trying yeah. to like use you for their you know their evil deeds. And then whichever one uh, loses the battle of the mines gets tossed out on the New Jersey Turnpike. Wait, what? There's a movie, Being John Malkovich, oh, okay. where people, there's a door inside <laughs> right. this, like, office building that if you go through this door, you end up inside the mind of actor John Malkovich. Right, yeah. And then, like, after a certain period of time, you just get, like, shoved out. You just land on the side of the road in New Jersey, if I'm not mistaken. Right, yeah, I, yeah. I, I feel I, I can't remember the last time I saw that movie, and I was really young, and I was I, just like... I've just, never seen the movie all the way through. Right, yeah, I don't, like... I just, yeah, I remember people being ejected, like, on the side of a road. Yeah. And then there was one guy that was, that they were using him to do, like, puppet shows or something like that. Yeah, uh, John Cusack's character was a puppeteer, and so he used John Malkovich being famous. He used him to further, you know, just, I don't know. Yeah. Be a famous puppeteer, puppeteer guy. Yeah, yeah. I just remember what, that. What a bizarre <laughs> yeah. idea for a movie. And if I'm not mistaken, like, John Malkovich was the first choice of the people who wrote this movie. If he had said no, I guess they would have come up with somebody else. But like, what if one day someone was like, hey, Jeff, I, I wrote a movie. It's called Being Jeff from Interparty Conflict. <laughs> and so they found out that you had written a story all about controlling your body. Uh-huh. Not just some person named Jeff, but your body. Uh-huh. <laughs> Anyway, That's ridiculous. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, that'll do it for the the dragon's horde. <laughs> okay. I think uh, that'll also do it for our movie chat. Oh. <laughs>
I would really like if someday we were able to, to talk, uh, talk about uh, movies. Movies or what, something. What's the name of the, the thing again? Sorry, so this is this is the Eye of Balmar. So so being Balmar. <laughs> yeah. Or rather Balmar well, being you. Bal- yeah, yeah, Balmar being <laughs> Balmar being Jeff. There you go. <laughs> if somebody wanted to submit items for the Dragon's Horde, questions for us to discuss, or stories for the funeral pyre, how would they do so? If they could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. Yes, they can. All right. You want to get into some questions? Uh, sure. All right. Our first question comes from Kryptonic901. This was on Reddit. How much combat is too much? Yes. Uh, this was actually submitted on our on our subreddit. We don't, we don't always get... Uh, we don't often get submissions directly on our subreddit. A lot of the time it's because I've gone out and, you know, uh, asked people to submit questions or sometimes we'll get them like message to me or emailed to me or like sent to me in a message on Facebook or something. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, every now and then someone will reply on the subreddit or just post on the subreddit saying like, hey, you know, this is a question I have. And uh, I always like it when people do that because the subreddit, you know, not many people use a subreddit. I basically, I post our episodes, mm-hmm. I post weekly questions. Uh, speaking of which, I forgot to post a question this week. I should probably do something about that. Um, anyway, and uh, and whenever somebody does submit a question, I usually try to like give a quick response because I don't I don't know how soon we'll get to these. I think this one was submitted like a month or a month ago or something. Mm. Um, but anyway, so he, uh, Kryptonic submitted this question a little while ago, and he gave a little bit of a um, little bit of context. He's in two groups. One of the groups he's in is you know it's a lot of fun. There's maybe sixty percent of the time is spent in combat, forty percent of the time is spent you know role playing or story progression and so on. Sure. The other group. Uh, is nearly 100% combat. He says, I've only played two sessions with them, but they've played together for nearly a year. In the last two sessions, they've spent a total of 15 to 20 minutes not in combat. Okay. So that's that's a lot of combat. Travel is literally described as you travel for a few days until your next fight. <laughs> Every fight is punctuated with a long rest, so there's no incentive for me to conserve spell slots. Hmm. He also says that, uh, you know, the other people in the group seem to be having fun, including like the loud and obnoxious barbarian, He's a new guy, and so so he says. Uh, <laughs> I I recognize that I'm the problem player, and I I think that's a it's an interesting a, a interesting perspective, right? Yeah. But uh, the, you know, the question is how much combat is too much, mm-hmm. and I think this is uh, this is an interesting question. Yeah. Maybe a short question, but uh, you know, a short answer rather. But you know, we can get something out of this. So I I think we both agree. Probably the the, the real answer is that, uh, that there isn't really a, a too much combat. Right. Yeah. At least, yeah, at least in, in when you're talking just in general, like it, combat is combat. It's a big part of the game and it's fun. And it, it's, it is what the game focuses most of its uh, its its page time on. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so, I mean, like if if everybody's having a good time mm-hmm. and combat's all you're doing, then that, you know, just just do combat. That's fun. Yeah, that's the so that seems what the like the second group. Seems to be like that, where that's just what they like doing is combat. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like there, I I like different types of games. There have been times where I've I've you know joined a group that's mostly combat and it's mm-hmm. a lot of fun. Other times I've joined a group that's mostly role playing and it's a lot of fun. There have been times where I've shown up to a group like expecting a lot of role playing and then it's just all combat. And I mean that's not it's not a problem. No. It's just uh, if that's what that group wants. Yeah. Um. So in this case, yeah, like if if the second group. They like combat. That's what they like. So it's more a question of of whether your play styles match. And uh, savvy listeners might notice that Kryptonic nine hundred one is also the one that submitted the question of, you know, how long do I give a group before I realize our play styles don't match? Oh yeah, okay, yeah. So, so this, this might be what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> so if if it's not really meshing with you, mm-hmm. you know, that's fine. You can you can always bow out if if you want to stick with it in the hopes that maybe you will get some some fun out of it. Yeah. You can do that too. Now we have talked in the past about combat taking too long. Definitely, combat it's, does take a long time. Yeah, and so like if if the combat's dragging out, and and in that case, it's usually you know if it's dragging on, you're not really having fun, and mm-hmm. so that I mean, like too much combat, you know, like the frequency of combat is it isn't a problem as long as everybody's okay with that. It's right. more just like the the duration of a single combat or like yeah. or, or even like a single round of combat if it if it's dragging on for a long time. Mm-hmm. But I feel like if it is drag like if it is dragging on for a long time, it's not the group the type of group that likes combat because I, I'm I'm assuming the 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 group where he's he's playing in that is like almost 100 percent combat like they they know how to get through combat because that's their that's their deal that's what they like to do yeah yeah probably so and then you know and, and he says that 
they do a long rest after every battle. Right, right. Which is pretty... Yeah, that, that definitely sounds like that is a group that is there for the combat, which I... I can respect because, like, I like the combat's fun and like using all your characters' abilities, especially when you could do it. You can use every ability, yeah, in every combat because you know you're gonna get a long rest, so you get to like have fun and use your character to its fullest. You know, like, but there is there's a lot there is some fun in like the like con, you know conserving certain abilities and like you know having to. Um, you know, having to make those choices as to, you know, do I use this ability now? Do I use it later? Like, do, you know, do we take a long rest now and risk, you know, getting ambushed in the night? That sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, this type of gameplay, uh, especially where it is it is so explicit that every fight has a long rest afterwards, it does really incentivize, incentivize certain character types and sure. disincentivize others. Like, I couldn't see someone playing a warlock in this type of game because the whole point of a warlock is that you have very few abilities, mm-hmm. but you get them back more often than everybody else. So if yeah. you're taking a long rest after every fight, there's no benefit. To yeah, that. And, and there's there's a there's a lot of classes that have like at least later level abilities that like turn a uh turns turn something that comes back in a long rest into a something that comes back in a short rest. Mm-hmm. So but it, it, it's like I think like level like 14 or 17 bard or something like that, their okay. bardic inspiration comes back on a on a short rest instead of a long rest. And so like that's a high level thing. Yeah. To, and it's a nice benefit, but in the in a game where you're going to get a long rest after every battle anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Um, I think I've even... I'm sure we've mentioned before that, like, in 4th edition, I would do... I would I would literally just run encounters. Mm-hmm. I would I would get, you know, whoever felt like playing together would make 4th... You know, some people would make 4th edition characters, and then I would just run a, just encounters. Like, I would just grab some monsters out of the monster manual. There was no pretense of story. I don't even think there was, like level progression i think it was just hey let's have some fun playing in a combat yeah because you know fourth edition combat was a pretty solid system so yeah. it was a good time and then i that's how i learned a lot of the monsters that i liked because it's like oh i've never used this monster oh sure let's u- use it before yeah one of my favorite fourth edition monsters was the um crap what was it called it's called like the the hunting spider or something huh. it was a spider that as a as, as a standard action could shift up to like six squares and make an attack that knocked the target prone. Yikes. So what that meant was that they didn't provoke attacks opportunity from this movement. It was movement on top of their actual movement. Uh-huh. And then their target had to spend their move action to get back up. So like it was, oh, it was so good. Jeez. Anyway, but I, I discovered those because I was just running some fourth edition counters. And yeah. I was like, hey, I've never used these spiders before. And then I loved them. And then I used <laughs> them in, in every game after that. Great. <laughs> but yeah, so so it's it's really just a matter of you know, whether the group is having a good time, there really isn't a such thing as if I had to give an answer, the answer is once the group thinks that there's too much combat. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. like if there, there really isn't a better answer I can give. Yeah. Cause yeah, you know, it's, it's some people really enjoy the combat. Some people enjoy less combat and more and more enjoy role playing or more enjoy exploration. And there isn't a wrong way to play the game. It's just a matter of whether the group is a good fit. Sure. Our next question comes from Prozano, I believe. Sure. Uh, this was on Reddit. As the DM, is it a good idea to sit the players down and have a discussion of the campaign so far? So this is kind of like a, um, it's like a, it's almost like a session zero, but in the middle of a campaign, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's a, I, yeah, that's a good idea. Like, I, maybe like at like, like between like major story arcs or something like that you can yeah. kind of like you know previously on interparty conflict you know that sort of thing <laughs> sure uh that, yeah that's i i don't see it, i don't see why that's a you know why, why that's not a great idea yeah i i i'm trying to figure out if i've ever had a campaign where i or anybody else any of the dms i played with did that cuz that is a really cool idea yeah i mean we would do things where like you 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 usually have like one of the players sum up what happened the time before. I usually do try to do that. Yeah, yeah which is which is a cool way to do that too. Because if you do it, then you're just gonna say exactly how it is. If if a player does it, they it's it they get to recall it from their perspective. Yeah, and I do like that. And you know they get to add their own little details here and there if they want to. Yeah, because a player is always gonna see what's happening differently than the DM. Yeah. And, yeah. and then it actually might spark an idea in the DM. Cause if the, if the players are, are is noticing a thing that the, that the DM like in a different way than the DM knows, knows that like, if you see it, 
basically if they see something one way and the but the dm knows it's another way they can kind of play on to that yeah yeah um but yeah as, yeah as far as like uh just like a, having a basically a session devoted to kind of like summing up the the you know the campaign so far and yeah like seeing or like, where everybody is at with their character yeah or just like asking what everybody's thoughts are on like whatever sure. how everybody likes it it could be that there might be a time you're running a campaign you get a few sessions in and then like nobody's really digging the current plot line right yeah and that's you know that's not a problem if if you're willing to to take that and and run with it if the players want to do something else yeah better to find out you know halfway through the campaign than three quarters of the way through the campaign sure or like uh, say the like the first few adventures that were really combat oriented and uh so there you you're go. like hey like do you you know do you guys like this combat thing or do you want to you want know, to you want to slow down on the combats we can we can kind of work around that yeah so yeah to get it kind of get a feel of what the group is feeling and also kind of help you know like you know, sum up the story so like you know there aren't any like details missed or anything like that because it could be a lot. Of, there can be a lot of times where like the characters might get sidetracked or like you you're going on like quests that this one NPC is sending you on, and you completely forget that the reason you're doing that is because that NPC works for you know the king or something like that. Like you, sure, you forget sure. the overall you know the overall like plot of the of the campaign. You know, because you've been going on all these like little little mini adventures along the way, so it's good to kind of like wrap everything up into one package so that the characters can look at it from a different perspective. Yeah, in the the adventure zone, you know, I've mentioned the adventure zone many times, and uh, there's there's a point in that because it was it was one campaign at first, it was one campaign that was spanned like two years, and then there was a point maybe halfway through where the the McElroys, who the these three brothers and their dad they're the the players in the DM mm-hmm. of this group yeah macaroni they, yes the the macaroni <laughs> brothers they had an episode where um it wasn't an actual episode it was just like them just talking about the campaign itself because mm-hmm. uh, you know they had a pretty big following by that point and I want to say at one point Griffin the DM he he gave a recap of the story up until that point and he put emphasis on certain things that the players or the listeners might not have really put a lot of thought into. Okay. And it, uh, you know, I, I think the players probably knew pretty much all of it by that point, but like a lot of listeners might have heard that and then realized, oh, that that is who that NPC was, or oh, that is where they got that thing. And so then that, that lets, it sh- sort of just gets all the information into one place so that the people involved can, can you know, look at it from a different perspective mm-hmm. and then see everything right next to each other instead of having to, yeah. to think back. And so I think that could be really good for a campaign, especially if the campaign's been going a long time. If there's been a lot of foreshadowing and such. Yeah. It couldn't hurt to to bring that up sometimes. Yeah. It's kind of like your second viewing of a movie or a television show yeah. or something like that. So where you like where all those connections kind of click in your head like, oh, that was that one guy. You right. know, like because like, you know, like a character gets introduced early on in the show and then like you don't see him for like half a season and then a thing happens and like. You go and you go like after a year or whatever, you go back and watch that show again and that character shows up for the first time. You're like, oh, that guy's going to do things. <laughs> oh, he's going to be. Oh, right. You know, something that I always think is so goofy on on TV. It's when whenever a show has those like, you know, previously on whatever. Yeah. Anytime that you in the previously on, if they show a character that hasn't been on the show in a long time, you're immediately like, OK, that character's coming back. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. It is sort of a like, here's what's going to happen. Like or like this. The, here are the characters you're going to be seeing in the show. Yeah. Game of Thrones does that a lot, at least in the in the later seasons. Um, like, yeah, yeah. It's like previously on Game of Thrones. And like it basically does like, it, you know, it'll. You're like, it'll show a clip from like two seasons ago yeah. of a character you haven't seen in like two seasons or at least haven't done, hasn't done anything too major in two seasons. You're like, oh, that guy's going to show up and probably die. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So like, yeah, it, it is very much a like, you know, like, you know, coming attraction sort of thing. It's like, it's a, you know, here's a, like a teaser as, you know, you can guess maybe what's going to happen because these characters are going to be involved in this episode sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, they, yeah, they, they do that a lot. Um, yeah, so I, I think um, it definitely could be a good idea to sit the players down and, you know, just talk about the, the campaign so far. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, probably don't do it too often. Sure. Or, um, or yeah, or if you do it regularly, like, have it, it, you know, maybe not take up a whole session, but it could just be, like, every few adventures you do, like, a little summary, summary sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, as, as the DM, it can be kind of a thankless job sometimes. I'm not saying that... Uh, 
all DMs necessarily like deserve everybody to be patting them on the back or anything. But sure. like, you know, it's it's a lot of work and a, and a lot of the time the players might be having a good time, but they might not be voicing that. And so, um, you know, it might it, maybe this could just be a thing to just say like, hey, what are you guys how are you guys enjoying the campaign so far? Right. And that might be the player's opportunity to be like, oh, yeah, I'm really, really liking it. I guess I haven't said so. So thanks a lot. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Just a good, good time to kind of get a gauge on how everybody's doing. Sure. So, yeah, absolutely a good idea. All right. This next question comes from Justin from Crit, Aca- or Crit Academy. Yes. And actually, <clears throat> I forgot to do this earlier. Let me go ahead and remind everybody to check out Crit Academy. It's another podcast. We're all part of the uh, the Crit Nation Fellowship. Mm-hmm. Crit Academy is a really good podcast. Uh, Justin, Ian, and Brandon, they come up with reusable content for players and DMs alike. They just recently had an episode about, like, making your own campaign, like building your own campaign setting. Sure. They had an episode where they they kind of they kind of made an adventure on the air. Oh, yeah. So they, like, you know, using the DMG, they rolled a bunch of stuff, and, <laughs> and they were like, okay, this is what our adventure is going to be about. Um, so, yeah, they're a lot of fun. We um, we played D&D with Justin uh, a month or two ago. Yeah. Um, I guessed it on their episode on a, an episode of theirs a long time ago. It's, it's a really fun podcast. Yeah, they're awesome. Um, also, another podcast on the uh, on the Crit Nation Fellowship is D and D Character Lab. Oh yeah, they are these two guys that they make characters and then kind of pit them against each other in a battle of wits. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, they have a good time. Yes. All right. So Justin asks if a spellcaster enters an anti magic area, is there any indication of the fact, or is it only when they try to cast magic? Uh, do they? Do they know that they're in the field? Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is this is sort of a cool little interesting question. As far as the rules go, I don't think there's supposed to be any way that you can detect it other other than trying to detect. Like, I I, I guess you can detect an anti magic field by using like detect magic on it. It sounds a little odd, but I think yes. Like if technically you're, if you're it, it is an abjuration. It, if you're outside of it, you can. You, I guess you would probably like see the lack of magic or something i, I mean like i said it, it's it's an abjuration spell so i think in theory it w- on the outside it would give off yeah the same kind of whatever yeah it, i guess it's possible like in the description it says something against that but yeah maybe but, yeah. taking out the book is too much work <laughs> <laughs> but yeah as far as the, as the mechanics of the games game go i don't i don't think there's any like inherent what like you know, instinctual way to know, like, oh, I'm, I'm in an anti-magic field. Yeah. I mean, maybe if you have, like, a light spell active sure. and then it goes dark, or if you have, like, a buff that makes you really quick or something, you might notice, oh, I'm not as quick anymore. Yeah, there's there's probably a bunch of ways to do little tells, and, like, in the and the DM might have it be less obvious or more obvious. Mm-hmm. Um, so, like, it, say you, like, you use prestidigitation a lot. You just, you have, like... You can create like a small like trinket or something. With yeah. Pres- so like your character always has that trinket on hand and like fiddles with it or something. And then like you it's suddenly it's gone. But like the the DM might have it be a perception thing that you your your hands just like fiddling as like so like <laughs> prestidigit prestidigitation fidget spinner. Oh, no. Oh, no. What did I do? <laughs> what did I do? That's its own spell, Jeff. Okay, what have I done? You can't do that prestidigitation uh, because fidget spinners are clearly magic items. You can't create a magic item with prestidigitation. <laughs> so, like, yeah, like basically, you know, picture a fidget spinner with guy. It's ugh. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, you know, you know, you're fiddling with it and, you, and you're absent-minded about it. So, like, maybe you don't notice it right away, and yeah. you're like, and then you look and your hand is empty, and you're like, what the heck? And then, and then you can be like, oh, you make an intelligence check and see, like, oh, I think we're we passed by some anti magic field or something. Mm-hmm. Um, another interesting idea would be, um, depending on the class, yeah. Uh, so like a warlock, the yeah warlocks get the get their ability from uh, other world, uh, all, like an otherworldly patron or like a in, like a like a demon or something like that. Mm-hmm. Although I think some of the newer newer ones there's like a hexblade one or something which i don't think has a patron you just like oh, have yeah. different abilities or something in xanathar's guide i yeah that's a good question i, I haven't i haven't looked much at it yeah. yet but anyway so like you know s- say you get your powers from one of the like the old gods or whatever mm-hmm. whatever that one is um and like they're they, you know they contact you from time to time like suddenly it goes quiet yeah you know you don't hear them but that might be something that happens on the regular like you might you know, when you call upon your powers, you can use them, but he's like, they're not always actively talking to you or anything, but like, maybe you like normally feel a presence, but then when you step in the field, like you, you feel strangely alone. 
Yeah. And so like, but that might be, that could be anything. So that, you know, you'll ha- you might not know right away. Oh, I'm in an anti-magic field. You might just be like, oh, something's up. Right. Yeah. So I think like rules wise, I don't think there is any sort of like there is, there's no indication, but I think there's plenty of ways the DM could have it be. Mm-hmm. you know could could like have the flavor of it be something and i think there's a lot of ways a lot of really cool ways to do that like yeah. you were saying with the warlock or with a cleric or something like you momentarily feel like you are no longer connected to this 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 oh sure other being that has been granting you power your entire life oh another uh from the new book uh, yeah the forge domain looks kind of really cool oh yeah um like first level you can have your armor or your weapon be like a plus one magic weapon thing. Oh, you just like you. I think you spend an hour. Yeah, and you can turn your armor into like it gives you a plus one to your AC, or I think the weapon is just like plus one damage or something like that. But it's counted as magical. Gotcha. So it's like that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty. Oh, that reminds me. Um, I forgot to mention this, but last week I I played D and D again with these buddies from work. Uh huh. And uh, and we found fa- we found a magic item. Uh huh. You know what magic item that was? What's that? Well, let me just put it this way. We can now produce two gallons per day <laughs> of, of mayonnaise. mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> that is a, that's an amazing yes. item. Yeah, we, we were going through this thing, and the, the DM was like, yeah, and you see there's a, there's a jug up on this pedestal. And I'm like, that, that, that better be what I think it is. And then we got it, and he was like, yeah, I don't know. It's called the alchemy jug. I don't know what it does. And I was like, I know what it does. I know what it does. It makes mayonnaise. Yes. And people are like, what? It makes honey, too. Yeah. We're, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it makes Honey, f- vinegar, beer, wine, water, acid, all sorts of stuff. And mayonnaise. And mayonnaise. I thought you guys made up the nope. mayonnaise. The mayonnaise it is, is uh, in the book. part of it. It's, it's written in the book. It's yes. typed in there. It is printed, and there's several copies of the book, and each copy has mayonnaise yep oh <laughs> ridiculous yeah, sorry. so so with uh yeah with an anti-magic field i think there's there's plenty of cool ways the dm could could flavor it to be uh mm-hmm. you know to be some sort of a noticeable effect right yeah you know um, it's not gonna be like a super obvious thing but yeah it could be that like you know if you're a a wizard or something like suddenly you i don't know you just you maybe you momentarily like cannot access the memories of your magic right yeah because like you know you can't cast spells in a magic field in an anti-magic field i'll actually get back to that in just a moment but um so so it's like you know when you when you're casting spells that are previously memorized it's just for a moment like your that part of your brain is like blocked off yeah and you you might not realize it immediately but once you realize it you can't stop focusing on it Mm -hmm. or if you're something like a sorcerer where your your magic is just like part of you right yeah you could get in there and then you could just like suddenly feel like you're operating from like outside your body or something. Right. Maybe like you're, you're, it's like you're looking through someone else's eyes and like controlling a robot or something. I forget exactly how sorcerers work in fifth edition, but I want, I, I, I think there's a couple different variants, mm-hmm. uh, but one of them is like your, your blood of like your dragon blood in yeah. you or something like that. So like, I don't know if like you get like physical features of dragons as I think a, you do eventually. But, yeah. Uh, and so, but I mean, maybe like I don't know, you flavored your character to be kind of like dragon-ish. Yeah. And then, like, when you step in the magical field, like maybe you have like a like your you have like a deep raspy voice or something like that. But mm-hmm. then when you step into this field, you like you, you know the DM's like you notice your voice is a little less raspy and deep. It's kind so of, like as as you're walking through, you're like, fellow adventurers, let us let us go into this <laughs> cave here. Wait, what's happening? <laughs> what's wrong with my voice? Stop looking at me. I cast magic missile. It's not working. <laughs> Sorry. No, <it's> fine. <laughs> so uh, I don't know exactly where 5th edition lands on this, but back in 3rd edition, mm-hmm. whether it was intended or not, technically speaking, you could cast spells in an anti-magic field as long as they... As long as you yourself were the target, and it would it wouldn't work while you were there, but like you could go into an anti magic field, cast I don't know mage armor or something, uh-huh. step outside of the anti magic field, and you would have mage armor, huh? Because the way that it worked, the way that the mechanics worked in third edition, it was that the it it suppressed the effects of spells, and it also caused you to no longer have line of effect for any of your spells. Okay. So you could not cast a spell on someone else, even if you were touching them, because the field causes you to not have line of effect. 
However, you don't need line of effect to cast spells on yourself. Sure. So technically speaking, and it, it w- again, it wouldn't have an effect until you were outside of the anti-magic field. Right. But technically speaking, you could cast spells on yourself, hmm. which was a little weird and I'm sure was probably not the intent. Right, yeah. But that's, that's how it was. Huh. Yeah. Very recently, just another little tangent about anti-magic field. Um, very recently, there was a discussion on the 5th edition Facebook group about anti-magic field. Somebody was asking something about, like... What happens if like a zombie walks, if a, if a skeleton, they're asking if a skeleton walks into an animated skeleton, walks yeah. into an anti-magic field. And some of the more, even the more like rules savvy people said, oh, the, the skeleton just, it stops working. Like, you know, it just falls to a pile of bones. Sure. And that's actually not the case. Huh. Because when you cast spells to animate uh, an undead or to like, if you create a golem or something like that, that magic is n- is instantaneous. Sure. So once that magic has happened, the magic is not there anymore. Like it's it's not like you cast animate undead and then this pile of bones has a permanent magical yeah. effect. It is now a creature. It is a creature that is not under the effect of magic anymore. If that makes any sense. It, no, it does. And, and I was going to say it was like okay, so anything instantaneous, but that wouldn't be necessarily true. But I I'm thinking of like like create object sort of spells that ones that are like instantaneous where you're like you make yeah uh, that, that would depend on which spell you're casting well so think of um like the fabricate spell right i, I don't know if that's in fifth edition i think it is i, I don't it, know. Any, anyway the fabricate spell is basically you take raw materials and turn it into a a crafted object or right. something like that so like you know, using a fabricate spell on on to like make like a small trinket or something like that, and then you threw that into an anti magic field. I, I would assume that would just stay, right? Like it wouldn't it wouldn't turn back into raw materials. Exactly. And then you, exactly. And then as you take the raw materials out, they turn back into the <laughs> to the object right. again. That'd be ridiculous. Yeah. In the same way, like if you if you uh, let's say you get your arm cut off, and then someone casts regenerate and puts your arm back on or whatever. <laughs> Your arm isn't going to fall off. Oh, my God. That would be great, though. <laughs> oh. Oh, okay, okay. Now I want there to be, like, a more, like, advanced version of, uh, uh, of like, any magic field. <laughs> like, a, like a reverse magic field or something yeah. like that. Like, any, any, any magical effect that has happened to you, like, can be undone. So, okay, this is a super-duper mega tangent, but you just remind me of this horror movie that I watched a long time ago. Okay. I don't remember what the movie was called, so I'm going to spoil it. It's it was some it was it was a some low budget movie from like I don't know seven or eight years. It was not not a big movie. I doubt anybody has or ever will see it. But this movie it was this horror movie where like this family they this this married couple they move into this house, and then the the wife and the family starts experiencing like these blackouts. She can't really she doesn't know what is going on. So they, they install these security cameras. Mm-hmm. And basically, it turns out that, like, periodically, every few days, the creepy neighbor from next door breaks into their house, kills her. I think they probably rapes her or something. I don't know. Anyway, ends up, he kills her, and then he has the ability to bring people back from the dead. So he, like, comes in, kills her, brings her back from the dead, and then leaves. And then she wakes up, and she has no memory of what happened. Huh. But... You know, that's that's kind of standard horror movie there. That's that's not really anything groundbreaking. But what I think this movie did that was really, really cool was that at the end of the movie, once they find this out, she like fights back and kills him. And when he dies, every person that he has brought back to life also dies oh. because he is no longer like sustaining them. So like he dies and then the movie cuts to like this montage of like dozens of women just going about their daily lives and then suddenly like their head falls off oh. or they just like their I don't know their chest rips open and their heart is gone or something like this it is just like the last like 30 seconds of this movie you go through the movie thinking okay okay they're gonna stop and they killed him and then oh no oh and then it's the double whammy of he's been number one he's been doing this to people for years and then number two that like this horrifying thing that all these people are just dying. Right, yeah, just like sp- spontaneous death everywhere. Yes. Anyway, you just remind me of that with your your reverse magic. Sure, theory. sure. 
But I was just I was like, I was like, oh, he's like, it's like a serial killer, but he's only killing one person. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess. But then but, I, uh, I mean, like, I guess in the end, he was more than one person. But like, yeah, that's it. That's an interesting thing where it's like serial killer with the ability to bring people back from the dead. So it's like, really, you know, he could technically be a serial killer, but only kill <laughs> one person. Right, right. <laughs> It's like if uh, like Dexter could uh, bring people back from the dead. So like Dexter mixed with Pushing Daisies. Oh, I, re- I haven't seen either of these shows, but I, I know the <laughs> Those premises are both, both great shows. I loved Pushing Daisies. Oh, I love that show. So cute. Oh, yeah. oh people die. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so again, just to recap, the uh, I don't think that there's a rules indication right. that something that it would feel different. But hey, if the DM wants to, I'm all for it. Yeah, th- there, yeah, there's plenty of subtle things that can be done that won't necessarily give it away right away. Mm-hmm. But I mean, there's there's probably plenty of things that it would that it would trigger, like and any magical item you might have might. Like you know, like plenty of magic items glow, yeah. And so yeah. if it stops glowing, I'm like, oh, that's weird, yeah. You know, so there's a bunch of little ways to kind of give hints to your character to the to the players, uh, you know, and some as far as going into like the specifics of like how that character is magical, like you know, with the warlock and everything. So sure, yeah, yeah. So like that that's an opportunity for the the player and the DM to, you know, both flex their their creative muscles. All right. Well, I think that'll do it for the questions for today. Mm. Um, so let's take a moment. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> <sighs> and then let's remember those people who have come before us, who have maybe made the world a better place, maybe who just kind of the, you know, the the gods were against them that day. Let's think of the people who have fallen as we toss another log on the funeral pyre. All right. Uh, this story was submitted by Reddit user Modded Gaming. Mm-hmm. And Modded Gaming says, In my group, we had a cleric and a ranger. The ranger made enemies of a baker before becoming an adventurer. Huh. They managed to steal some very valuable items from the baker, pushing the baker to suicide. What? And pushing him to haunt this ranger until the ranger died. During one of the fights, the baker, so the baker's ghost, showed up and possessed the ranger. Oh. Both the cleric and the paladin in the group forgot about their spells to protect from good and evil, and the cleric forgot about their divine ability to remove the spirit. This clerical error oh. resulted in the death of the cleric as he lost his head to the possessed ranger. Oh, no. We still talk about this and joke about this today as this has happened nearly a year ago. Oh, jeez. So it's it wasn't even... The ranger that died it was the, <laughs> the cleric, cleric that died because this bake. Oh my goodness! <laughs> Clerical error. <laughs> Clerical error. Yeah, that was not my pun. That was modded gaming's pun. Stop it! <laughs> that was a Game Grumps reference. Cool. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. So let us let us remember this this forgetful cleric whose whose administrative error resulted in its death. So I can't use clerical error again. Clank clank. <laughs> To submit questions for us to discuss items to the Dragon's Horde or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, a running list of questions asked, and important links, go to interpartyconflict.com. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash interpartyconflict, or our subreddit at reddit.com slash r slash interpartyconflict, where I post weekly discussion questions for you. We're also on Twitter, at inpartyconflict. We're also on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you want us to to get a bigger listening audience, which means that we'll uh, you know have more questions to pull from and more you know more people supporting us, just you know a, a rating goes a long way. A rating on iTunes that's how people notice us sure, yeah. the best. Um, a review we haven't really gotten a new review in a while. We've, we have a few on there and they're all positive, but uh, it'd be nice to get some more. Um, if you feel like donating to us, we have a PayPal donate button on our website. Anything you can give us would go towards making the podcast better. Mm-hmm. Jeff, do you want to tell us about FriendQuest? FriendQuest, if you look up FriendQuest on YouTube, it is our YouTube channel. We have a couple playthroughs. We have Tower of Doom and Shadow of Mistara, as well as a couple episodes of playing uh, 
uh, the newer uh, Gauntlet game. Yep. Uh, any suggestions for games you guys want to see us play? I mean, we haven't done any recording on it in a while. But, yeah, mainly uh, just not having free time. Yeah, pretty much. Or or if there's anything that I mean, like I got plenty of free time to play games. I, I usually play a few hours of games before you know before bed. So if anybody has any ideas for games they want to see me play, I yeah, know. yeah, there you go. I'm I'm you know I'm always looking for an excuse to play video games. <laughs> sure, sure, really the thing. So you know. Any any ideas? Uh, either send it to our normal, you know, emails. Uh, Gabe will let me know, or uh, the friend quest at gmail dot com is the uh, is the yeah. email I have set set up for it. So. Cool. All right. If you head over to audibletrial dot com slash conflict, you can get yourself a free audiobook and you get us free money. There's over 180 thousand titles to choose from. If you go on there, I guarantee you'll find something you like 100 percent for free. Also, please go to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take our short survey. It takes just a couple minutes. And if you do, you get two free printable board games, courtesy of Tom and Mary over at hollandspiel.com. Woo. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, till next time. Smoke your turkey with applewood. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to be delicious. Yes. All right. Bye. Why is this piece of garbage framed? <laughs>